Super Smash Shows. Welcome to Super Smash Shows. The rules are simple. I pick three shows connected by a theme. I watch the first episode of each show and then cruelly force them to fight in a battle royal. There can be only one winner, the show I would be most likely to continue watching. This time we'll be making the first episode of these three shows fight each other. Blue Dragon, Hyper Dimension Neptunia the animation, and Persona 5 the animation. The connection between these three shows is that they are all based on video games. Two of these are based on game franchises I've played before, so it will be exciting to see how things were changed in the process of animification. For an extra bit of spice, I'm watching all three shows in the original Japanese dub this time. No particular reason, it just sort of happened that way. So without further ado... Get ready for the next battle. battle. Blue Dragon! Show number one is Blue Dragon. Based on the video game for Xbox 360, the animated series was directed by Yukihiro Matsushita, written by Akatsuki Yamatoya. Yada yada, support the official release. The episode begins with some lore and creation myths. The world was made of pure light but humans who were obsessed with the darkness decided to leave, and a world of darkness was born to contain them. Cut to two characters riding their not chocobos through the desert and climbing a tall cliff. The music is so Dragon Quest. I could just imagine running through a field in DQ11 to this. They've been looking for the town in the distance, and have finally found it. It then cuts to the obvious bad guy place. An obviously evil Lord Nene orders his minions to bring all children born of darkness to his kingdom so they may join his side. These just look like Dragon Ball Super filler characters. <laughs> yes, Bira Sama. He's the destruction god for Universe 13. The universe we don't talk about. We now see our main characters. Our lead is the young boy Shu, who is excited to learn that the legendary Night Master is coming to town. He will stop at nothing to become the Night Master's apprentice. He runs off leaving his friends in the dust. I like this guy already, he's got so much energy. So this is not Goku. The girl on the bike is not Bulma. Shu gets struck down by the bike of his not girlfriend Kluke. Oh god. And the two bicker like a married couple, which provided some amusement. Shu explains his plan. Indeed, Shu's plan is to knock random people on the head with a wooden stick. If they block the attack, they're the Nightmaster. I'm surprised they don't get arrested, leaving a pile of bodies in their wake. <laughs> They're gonna get thrown in a cell in a minute. Shu is about to stop a boy and ask him if he's the Nightmaster, but changes his mind. The boy, insulted by Shu's rudeness, picks a fight. The boy is about to teach Shu some manners, with some sort of mystical power. Oh, I love this guy already. But an attractive young lady stops him. Do they have stands? Do they have stands in this show? The lady's name is revealed to be Zola, and the boy, Jiro. They're the two from the intro. God, what a babe. <laughs> the main character's thinking the same thing. Zola apologizes for Jiro's rudeness. Shu wastes absolutely no time in attempting to attack Zola, and when she blocks the attack, Shu asks her to train him. Yeah. The Night Master! Awesome. Loving this so far. Zola refuses. She explains that not only is she not the Night Master, but she may not even be an ally. But when she discovers Shu's age, she ponders out loud, wondering if Shu is the one. 
Nevertheless, she leaves Shu with a quandary. What will you do if you possess power? If I had power, what would I do with it? Hmm. That's a very good question. Presumably, I would do whatever leads to me getting laid. It isn't long before Shu finds himself needing to answer that question. God, look at this guy, he's more chin than anything else. What a large chin. Oh, the chin man is here. The town is invaded by evil forces, but Jiro and Zola refuse to help. You have the power inside of you all alone. Save the town yourself. Shu decides to be a hero and does his best to push away the invaders. In order to draw out Shu's latent power, Zola secretly provokes the invaders and chaos ensues. I, I have no feelings for these characters whatsoever. Let the town get destroyed. I don't give a shit. It's the start of the JRPG. The main character's hometown always gets destroyed anyway. Badass. Badass. Zola takes on the enemy commander and calls upon her secret stand power. Well, they call them shadows in this show, but they're basically stands right out of JoJo. Badass. Is he gonna have a stand as well? <laughs> Star Puraptinum! Badass. This is so cool. <laughs> In the midst of battle, collateral damage to the nearby cliffside puts Shu's friends and the townsfolk in danger. In an effort to protect them, Shu's hidden power awakes. The blue dragon appears from Shu's shadow. And damn, what an incredible shot. And what an excellent first episode. So cool! Yeah, I'm, I'm sold on this show, absolutely. More than anything though, this just makes me want to grab the Xbox 360 game. I mean, I've got it. It's in my giant box of Xbox 360 games. I just never got round to playing it. Wow, so yeah, Blue Dragon, pretty good, pretty good. I really enjoyed that. There's definitely a lot of potential there, and provided the show explores its potential, uh, this could be a very good time. Hyper Dimension Neptunia, the animation. Show number two, Hyper Dimension Neptunia, the animation, is an animated adaptation of the popular Neptunia series of video games. The series is licensed in Australia by Madman Entertainment and in North America by Funimation, but has yet to be licensed for the UK. Yada yada, support the official release. In the original Hyper Dimension Neptunia, the goddesses, aka CPUs, of each kingdom fought each other in order to gain shares from their citizens, which basically represent the faith a nation's people have in their leader. So yeah, from what I remember of playing this game series, uh, video game consoles from the past are anthropomorphized into anime high school girls, essentially. Leanbox, Xbox, Loey, Wii, you get the idea. Now I'm going to be blunt and say that these games don't have any story, and they solely sell on their sex appeal, so I would not be surprised if this show sells on its sex appeal as well. This series explores a situation where the CPUs have signed a treaty to stop fighting among one another, striving to create an amicable relationship where all the nations can coexist in harmony. Beautiful big boob ladies touching each other. This treaty has done nothing to improve the rocky friendship between the nations, and has also led Planeptune's CPU, Neptune, to become complacent. No! <laughs> As a result, her hands-off approach to running the nation has led to a decrease in Planeptune's shares. The opening theme, Dimension Tripper, is an absolute bop. 
I love the color grading especially, something David Production has always excelled at. So I already cheated with these opening themes, I've already looked them all up. <laughs> Where possible, they're already in the uh, Super Smash Bros. playlist on Spotify. Neptune finds herself having to learn how to do her job from the other CPUs, most of whom are not exactly welcoming of Neptune, despite the signing of the peace treaty. Neptune visits CPU of last station, Noir, who in no uncertain terms tells her to go take a hike. I feel like every shot with Vert is gonna have, well, you know, buoyancy. Eventually, Noir provides Neptune with a monster slaying quest. Boing, boing, boing. <laughs> Well, what did I expect out of a Neptunia show, to be fair? Dogus! This ends in such a nature not all too surprising, given how the games are, and Noir finds herself having to take care of some cave monsters alone. Noir is ambushed by an enemy and finds herself powered down. Oh, oh, called it. Wouldn't it be great if Noir got in trouble and was asking for help and no one came and then she got defeated? You deserve every ounce of the pain that you're going through right now. Such a horrible, dislikable character. But Neptune steps in to save her. The outcome of the mission improves the bonds of their friendship. It's so unnecessary, isn't it? <laughs> Just in general, I feel like giving the series another chance. Later, Neptune is pleased to discover that thanks to the mission, Planeptune's shares have increased. Well, it was either the mission that did it, or raunchy photos of her younger sister Nepgear in compromising positions. Yeah, this is Neptunia through and through. So, that was Hyperdimension Neptunia. About what I expected a Hyperdimension Neptunia anime to be like, but with about 10 times more story than the games have. <laughs> is that mean? Is that mean? Persona 5 The Animation Show number 3 is Persona 5. The Animation, based on the Persona 5 video game for PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4. The animated series was directed by Masashi Ishihama and created by Cloverworks. Licenses in North America are Anaplex of America, UK is Anime Limited, and Australia is Madman Entertainment. Support the official release when it is made available. The episode starts with a voiceover from characters who should be very familiar if you've seen the game before, a cold opening that sets the tone for the episode. We see a grand casino, a group of thieves are attempting a heist. Their leader, Joker, makes quick work of the mission while his teammates communicate over the radio. Unfortunately, our slick lead character is captured and arrested. He is beaten to within an inch of his life, by corrupt and unjust police detectives who get hard off beating up a defenseless young man. The charges are intimidation, threats, defamation, assembling dangerous weapons, and murder. Surely that can't be right. After confirming his name, Ren Amamiya, they try to force a confession out of him. I ain't signing shit. Believing there is more to the case, a beautiful and compassionate female detective enters the interrogation room alone. Her name is Sei Nijima, and she puts it to Ren straight. His friends are fine so long as he cooperates, but she doesn't have enough time. To turn this case around and get to the truth, Ren must be honest with her. So six months before the episode began, our lead character Ren is forced to live under probation after bludgeoning a man who was assaulting a lady. He was expelled from his local high school and ordered to transfer to a different school many miles away. Oh, that guy. That guy. To hell with that guy. I hate that guy so much. On the way to his new home, 
a strange app appears on his phone. It activates by itself, and time appears to freeze around Ren, as a pillar of light and a figure appears before him. Appearing to be nothing more than a daydream, Ren thinks nothing of it, and deletes the app. Without the context of the game, this probably doesn't make a lot of sense. Uninstall this app. That's not gonna work, mate. It's nice to hear the game's soundtrack in this, though. Oh, that was tied to Kemi there, for a second. Ren reaches his new place of residence, a cafe named LeBlanc, owned by a curmudgeonly old man named Sojiro Sakura, a friend of a friend of his parents. Ren must agree to stay out of trouble for that time, keep his nose down, and get on with his studies. Of course, as we know from the start of the episode, that didn't happen. Ren's room is a dusty attic above the cafe, which Sojiro makes sure to point out is more than he deserves. Ren will be transferred to Shujin Academy, and will be visiting the school for the first time tomorrow with Sojiro. While Ren is passing the time in his dusty loft home, his phone makes a noise. The app he had uninstalled reappeared, and staring at it forces him into a deep sleep. It's spyware. <laughs> you can't uninstall it. It just reinstalls itself. He awakes in a prison, the Velvet Room, where Igor and his wardens Caroline and Justine preside. It is a place that exists between worlds, and takes on the state of the dreamer's mind. Because Ren feels like a prisoner, the Velvet Room takes on the appearance of a jail. It is now the following day. Ren awakes from what he believes was simply a dream. Man, I just had this crazy dream? A guy with a massive nose was talking to me? He visits his new school with Sojiro. Ren's homeroom teacher and the school principal seem to have little faith in Ren. The stories of his criminal activity have no doubt already spread as school gossip. We briefly flash forward to the interrogation room. Say probes Ren over the mysterious flyers that arrived on campus shortly after he started at Shujin Academy, and a calling card directed at Olympic medalist and gym teacher Suguru Kamoshida. Oh yeah, I'll tell you everything. Kamoshida's a piece of shit. She insists that Ren tells her everything he knows about what happened. Flashback to Ren's first day at school. Sheltering from the rain, he meets fellow student Ann Takamaki. Before they can get a chance at a conversation, the teacher from the photograph, Kamashida, offers them both a ride to school. Ren passes on the offer. Just as Ren is about to brave the rain, another student speaks to him. This blonde-haired, hot-blooded student has a problem with the teacher, but it hasn't been revealed to us why just yet. The strange app has once again appeared on Ren's phone and is listening to their conversation. Oh, the app was listening. As Ren and the student walk to school, Ren's phone once again appears to distort reality. Instead of reaching the school, the two end up at a bizarro looking castle where the school should stand. Upon entering the castle, the two are pounced upon by guards and thrown into an underground jail. The king of the castle approaches their cell. It's the teacher, Kamashida. He speaks in a strange, warped voice, and orders the students to be executed. Ren is forced to watch as the blonde-haired student is choked out and beaten in front of him. Unable to stand by this injustice any longer, Ren is spoken to by a mysterious voice. The voice offers Ren a pact. Blue flames surround him, and a being appears behind him. Arsene, a winged, masked thief wielding immense power. Episode end. What a fucking ending, right there. Ooh, that was so good. Holy shit. Oh, wow. Wowie. Ooh, that was so good. No, very impressed, very impressed. There can be only one winner, the show I would be most likely to continue watching. It's gonna be difficult this time. It's gonna be difficult. Battle Royal! Three shows based on video games 
but only one can be the winner winner chicken katsu dinner. Who's player one and who's player done? Who's got their hands on the controller and who's in the baby stroller? Let's find out. Persona 5 being a great anime, not really much of a surprise. I played through roughly six hours of the original Persona 5, long enough to know the gameplay really didn't gel with me, but also long enough to really get to love the initial four characters. Seeing these guys come to life in a full-length episode, rather than short animated sequences in the game, that really is magical. Everything's just on model and looking great. The game's soundtrack being put to good use in the series, with a pure vision for what the show is supposed to be. No cracks or gaps, and things you're meant to piece together over the course of the game are neatly explained as we go, leaving less guesswork, which just fits an anime better. The jumping back and forth from the past to the present in Persona 5 didn't work for me as a storytelling device, but in the anime it works better because things are just more compact. The story doesn't slow down for you to go buy medicine, or read a book on the train, or answer some question you need to google the answer for. It just goes smoothly from story point to story point, with just enough for newcomers to follow along. Knowing how I feel about the way Persona 5 plays, I'd probably just point you to the show instead of suggesting you play it. Writing and talking about Hyperdimension Neptune in the animation is really hard from memory. I had to go back and rewatch this episode another two times, once for the synopsis and again for this Battle Royale segment, just to have something to say. That seems like the Neptunia anime's biggest flaw, it's just sort of bland. The character stuff is good, but everything else is weak. It's a style over substance kind of show. Flashy effects and stunning visuals make for a show that's a splendor to watch, but as I always say, a good looking show isn't reason enough to sit through. Thankfully the character relationship stuff is a joy, though knowing what the Neptunia games are like certainly helps. Without the experience of playing these titles, I probably wouldn't be that interested in who any of these characters are. The story is negligible. I think it's going somewhere, based on this first episode. We see a group of villains and there's a bit of background stuff going on, but it seems not just second, but maybe third or even fourth to the fan service. Fan service, of course, is to be expected in something like Neptunia, and it's handled in a tongue-in-cheek way rather than being creepy. I certainly wouldn't watch this with anyone else around though, and if I'm going to watch anime on my own, it might as well be porn. Neptunia is great, but it can't really compete with porn. Honestly, a really damn good looking show though. David Production at their finest. I've watched this episode through now in both Japanese and English, and I think I prefer the dub actually. I might still watch this anyway as a filler show, but between more interesting series. Blue Dragon. Now this was a surprise. I was ready to write this off from first glance. I ended up picking this over some other shows based on video games, just because I managed to make a good group of 3, 4, Nintendo, Konami and Capcom episodes further down the line. So this ended up bunched here with the other two shows, because I figured it wasn't going to be a good pick. But this pacing is like, where did the time go? A really great anime episode doesn't have you looking at your phone to see what the time is, doesn't have you hovering over the duration bar to see how far along it is, it keeps you enthralled, and then you stop and say, was that really 22 minutes? And Blue Dragon's first episode has some excellent pacing. I got to the end and thought, was that really 22 minutes? And seeing Toriyama's style on something that isn't Dragon Ball related is a plus. It may not be the most stylish looking show, but it's a wonderful anachronism stew of robots and dinosaurs, and it takes me back to classic era Dragon Ball, aka good era Dragon Ball, before the overabundance of martial arts and green aliens from outer space, when it was just a dumb kid, a city girl, and a transforming pig wandering the countryside looking for treasure. Does Blue Dragon look like a cheap show? Yeah, it's got that Saturday morning cartoon look to it, not gonna lie. But it's like watching a 90s anime in 69, which is just sort of a surreal experience, but not uncomfortable. Whether or not the story will go anywhere interesting though, that's a hard question to answer. If it's your traditional good versus evil plot, then we're going to need strong characters. But Blue Dragon has that, and it's certainly going on my watch list. I think I'm ready to give my verdict. 
and you'll never see it coming. And the winner is... Persona 5 The Animation I don't think it comes as much of a surprise, given I just had so much more to say about it. An absolute quality series, and I could tell that just from this first episode. As someone who dropped off from the game because the gameplay style simply didn't gel for me, the ability to enjoy the same fantastic story, but without having to put the hours of work in, that's a win-win. All three shows this time were really damn good though. Persona 5 has the edge. On just being so packed full of story, it's constantly moving. Blue Dragon has better pacing in the first episode, no doubt about that. But it's hard to tell where the story will end up, and sometimes having a clue about the way a series will go certainly helps in deciding whether or not you're going to sit down and watch it. We know where P5 ends up at least somewhere along the line, as it flashes back to earlier events in the lead up to our hero's capture. Giving the win to any of these other shows would be a case of me lying to myself. I would most like to continue Persona 5 The Animation. It's a story rich, great looking show with attention to detail. It's not a phoned in adaptation that plays with the story and characters fast but loose. No, it remains as true to the source material as it possibly can, and delivers a truly watchable experience that will allow me to enjoy the story and characters of the game without having to put in 100 hours. So which would you have crowned the winner? Blue Dragon and its stand-wielding little kids? Hyperdimension Neptunia with its eccentric but lazy, no good titular goddess? Or Persona 5 and its phantom feathery? Share your choice in the comments below. I came up with this episode's theme, but do you think you can suggest a better one? Drop that in the comments too, or share your suggestion on the Flagrant Weeaboo Discord. This has been Real Asia. you've been watching Super Smash Shows, and I'll see you next time.